from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So I was going to try to handle some of the aspects of uh, people's personal collections. That first part was to kind of give a good overview of all that's happened in uh, media and, and audio technology throughout the years. And so um, I think it's fairly obvious to people here, but um, you know, sound recordings have this innate personal um, connection, and and um, and we want to preserve these things so that future generations can enjoy them. And and it's very fortunate that uh, the strategies that have been developed at large institutions like the Library of Congress can actually apply directly to the collections that, that you have, you know, even though there may be one or two items that, that the same strategies can uh, be used. So um, if we look at some of the contents of some of these things, um, you know, a personal collection can be anything because, you know, you can collect uh, commercial recordings. You can create uh, recordings or even recordings you haven't created yourself but are non-commercial and they can in include all sorts of uh, types of content, music and spoken word. I mean obviously um, recording family memories and, and things like that are, are uh, something that are fairly common. But even things like dictation, um, there are a lot of uh, recordings of uh, dictation that have been um, created over the year. There were a lot of disc formats that were based on uh, dictation. There were even belts and things. And um, sometimes you may not have uh, you know, a relative speaking about something that might be uh, relevant to you in a, in a family manner, a culture manner, but cultural manner, but you might, you know, want to know what their voice sounded like, and maybe all you have is, uh, is a dictation recording, and so those can be of value, and obviously things like broadcasts and live events. There also can be these, these kind of things, atmosphere, sounds of nature, and things like that, that that Tony Schwartz recording kind of fell into. Um, you know, there are people who make recordings of the sounds of trains and can actually identify trains based on um, the sounds of the engine and so forth. And so um, you kind of need to think very broadly when you, when you talk about the kinds of content that these recordings hold. You know, we've kind of seen, you know, the typical kinds of media that I, hopefully a lot of you either have or are aware of, the kinds of shellacs and LPs and cassettes and compact discs. And even now on your computer making recordings and so forth, those are all pretty common. But they're kind of places that, that audio sits that you don't necessarily think about. It's, uh, you know, videotape, you normally think of, well, this is video, but there's audio on there. And maybe the video's lost or, or, or something you don't care about, but there may still be audio on that. And that can also be important because if you're converting off a of videotape with modern uh, digital video, often the audio is compressed. And maybe you really want that audio at the highest fidelity possible. And so um, it's important to think of that not just as video, but also audio. And then cell phones obviously make recordings. People are making recordings every day. There are probably recordings made of you that you're not aware of. Hopefully nothing, nothing uh, private. But um, and then you know, there, you know, your answering machines may have recordings you want. Digital cameras allow you to, to uh, you know, um, put uh, uh, captions kind of on your on your photos. And so thinking about how to get all this stuff back and out and preserve it is important. And, and I put computer recordings in both categories because. You know, the computer's a great thing, but it also stores a lot of stuff that you're not even aware it's storing and so forth. And so um, maybe at some time you might want to take your computer and just do a search on common audio file formats and, and see what it pulls up, and it might pull up things that you're not, you, you, you wanted but you lost in the, in the, the nether, res, nether regions of your folder, poor foldering or whatever on your computer. So the necessity. So... Um, in the, in the media world, you know, this, this media starts to become obsolete after a while. Um, a lot of the reasons this media can be as cheap and, as, and, and available as it is is partially due to the recording industry. You know, they often used the same medias that we also used in home recording. You know, cassettes weren't just blank cassettes. There were, you know, commercial cassettes available. And so that whole mechanism that produces the media and the machines that play it back and so forth is all tied to each other, and as the, the record industry decides it, it wants to migrate to another format, 
either because they can get higher fidelity, they can get longer playtime maybe, all sorts of reasons they might want to, and plus I guess it also gets you to rebuy all the music you purchased previously. Um, you know, that, that becomes a problem, and, and so machines can become less uh, available, sometimes more expensive, harder to maintenance, harder to find people who can, who can operate them and so forth. And then, of course, without those, those playback uh, decks, you can't really get the sound back. You have to have that, that machine. And there's also a problem with the physical media that uh, it just naturally degrades. Um, uh, even, in, you know, even if you house uh, uh, media in certain kinds of sleeves or boxes, it can actually do damage and so forth. Um, and some of the media that's, that's less, uh, that's hardier, can actually is often brittle and so forth. So you can simply break it by dropping it or, or, uh, or dropping it you know, onto your playback deck or something. And on top of that, uh, just regular use of all this media will wear it down. Um, pretty much until the CD, almost, I believe, all media was contact-based. I, believe, I believe CD was the first non-contact-based uh, system for playing back audio. So, and if, and if you continue to live in that world, uh, that single copy, if that's your only copy of your collection, it's a pretty fragile collection. So current thinking has us moving to digital. And so um, we want to think about how to, how to not only migrate our, our uh, analog sources or our media-based sources into a digital format, but also um, how to deal with things that are, that are born digital, that started out as a digital uh, item. So, um, so that, of course, uh, mitigates these problems with, that we see with obsolescence of machines, playback machines, and degradation of the media. One of the big advantages is that digitization actually can give you very high quality um, audio at fairly cost effective prices um, if you wanted to do kind of the equivalent um, of what you can do easily with digital it would have been a very very expensive thing to do in analog media um, and as I was saying before these strategies for, for keeping these bits alive is, are fairly widespread so um, uh, Making sure that, that you can take care of those is, is something you can piggyback on other people's efforts. And backing up a digital file, of course, has no generational loss if it's done properly. So you don't have this problem of, you know, if you stay in the analog world and you, you say you have an original cassette recording and you want to then make a backup copy of it, you make another analog uh, generation of it, you lose a certain amount of fidelity. And after a while, it, it becomes very, very audible and noticeable. So in the digital world, as you make these subsequent backups of the original file, you can uh, retain the same fidelity. And of course, distribution is, is, and sharing these things is, is very simple, much easier than, uh, than dealing with physical media. You know, you can you know, either set up a website and have relatives go and, and download files you've uploaded or even email certain things. There are some downsides, are some challenges. Um, Certainly creating a digital file doesn't mean that file is good forever. You never have to think about it again. It still is going to live on some sort of um, physical media for the time being. We haven't figured out a way to somehow make it fly in the ether and not have some sort of physical connection. It has to sit, but it can't be migrated very easily. As I said, these, the copying of it is very easy to do. And also, you have to think about you know, you digitize into a certain file format. In audio, we're fairly lucky. Video actually has a lot more problems with this. But in audio, pretty much all file formats for audio are based on the same kind of technological idea of, of taking samples of the waveform. And so even though some file formats compress and throw away certain data, the fundamental uh, uh, technology behind how that recording is done is, is similar throughout the audio world. So, so if a file format becomes kind of obsolete or pushed to the side for some reason, it looks like migrating audio is going to be fairly efficient and fairly easy to do. Um, as I said, you do need the storage space um, and also the software you use. Um, you're going to want to make sure that you um, kind of catalog and database your digital assets carefully. You know, it's since you're, since the the, the digital asset is not tied to a physical format, it's much harder to kind of label the hard drive or label the, the, the source it's on. You, it's, it's, it's not really current thinking to think about it that way, although that may be easy in the short term. In the long term, 
the kinds of place you want want your titles and your database or the, the, the names of the people who are involved in the recording, whatever, are actually embedded in the file. And software is available that actually can allow you to do this, but um, some software is easier to use than others, so that's going to affect your ability to manage those files. So this is kind of a rundown of some, some of the kind of an overview of strategies for how to deal with these audio files. So the first thing you need to do is identify um, these files you want to save. And then you have to decide which of these recordings you really want to preserve. So in fact, identify actually applies wider than just digital audio files, but apply, apply to anything you want to make a digital audio file also. If you have physical media, you know, you want to identify what the content is. <clears throat> and then um, and then you want to migrate those things. So you want to uh, make sure you know where all those are. They may be on all sorts of uh, media at this time. You may have some burned on audio CDs. You may have some on a hard drive. You may have some on a flash drive. All sorts of places they can sit. And so then you want to organize this stuff, and you want to then generate the metadata. So this is like what I was talking about before. You want to um, come up with a consistent kind of naming f uh, system, come up with a way to identify these things. Often file names can't be you know, thousands of characters long, so you need to come up with some way so you can get back to these things because you'll find that you generate a lot of them, and since they're not something you can physically touch and kind of examine, you need to have a way to identify them. And so writing, writing up some really good metadata, coming up with a consistent uh, way of naming and way of identifying who's on things, um, dating things, that kind of stuff, is great to include. At that point, you can start to make multiple copies. Um, uh, it's always a good idea to have copies both locally so you can use them, but also copies that are off-site because you know, if you had a cassette, it's in your house, and your house has a terrible fire, you may lose all your all your content at that point. So if you have, uh, since these files are so easy to move around now and duplicate, you know, you can, you can possibly use one of these services that that's, uh, will store, give you storage space through the internet and you can upload things. If you don't have a large amount of uh, data upload or you have really fast internet connection. And a lot of those systems, of course, are based on managed systems. So they actually take care of kind of off-site um, duplication and so forth. So suddenly by, you know, uh, subscribing to one of these services, you may now have, you know, more than just even the one place that you think you're uploading to. They may be off-siting it to certain servers around them because if they, their server goes down, they're obliged to bring it back. So, so it's very, you know, in, in, uh, at the library, you know, we, we try to do all this stuff in-house and, and the cost of doing that is, is immense, you know, this kind of duplication and, and off-site management and so forth. And for the single... Um, person, that's just, it's just impossible to do that kind of level of, of um, uh, management on your own with your own equipment. But with these internet services, you can actually uh, do quite a good job. And then, of course, then there's the long-term thing. As I said, you know, just going digital doesn't mitigate never having to deal with things again. You know, you still need to keep, keep it up. You know, if you, if you did subscribe to an a, a, a internet service, storage service, you know, if you're going to pass these things on to your kids, obviously you need to let them know where this stuff is. You need to know what your contract is with these people. And, and you'll have to eventually maybe migrate these things to another service and so forth. So I wanted to give some links to some, um, uh, some different sources of um, information. We, um, Matthew is, and uh, Karen Fishman back there are both at the um, uh, uh, recorded or uh, are part of MBRS, which is the website for the uh, Recorded Sound Re Reference Center is there, um, and also the Packard campus. Um, I also have uh, the, the preservation division, which I'm a part here. We have a site that has a lot of uh, information about physical media and so forth, and, and kind of chemical breakdowns and things like that of, of media. Um, oh, I actually skipped one. There's also the um, uh, end up, which uh, I think a number of these handouts have that URL at the bottom. We also have um, uh, some of the uh, Berliner discs you saw early in the talk. Um, there's some on our American Memory site. There's some of those things up, and you can listen to a number of those recordings. And then also just some um, outside contacts. Um, the Association for Recorded Sound Collections is an important organization that has um, a lot of good information that can be used for personal collections. Um, there's a very interesting collection of cylinders that have been posted um, at, at UC Santa Barbara. Um, you can listen to a number of those. You can even, I think, order. I don't know if you have to be, can you, anyone order those? I guess, well, I don't know if you have to have a special purpose, but, but you can certainly listen to a number of those. Those are very interesting. And then also there's a fun site at uh, tinfoil.com which talks about 
early recordings and wax cylinders that we were showing that people use for personal recording. So thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.